Hello, my name's Chris. What's yours? Uh, welcome back to Marathon Man, where I go through Doctor Who from the very beginning. You join me as Doctor Who attempts a rather different depiction of an alien planet. There's something unique about the Keys of Mariners, or something which at least feels unique to my relatively limited experience with science fiction, and that is that it's a depiction of a planet which isn't just one galvanised blob of sci-fi. Mariners is home to different cultures, different continents and different lands. A lot of the time, a different planet is presented as an homogenised whole. A homogenised, homogenised, homogenised whole. But this is an alien world which is depicted as not too far away from our own in terms of how many vastly different setups there are within it. Now I know there are probably loads of similar examples within science fiction, it's just that while I enjoy science fiction, science fiction isn't necessarily my thing. And it's very careful to not be too similar to Earth as well, so while the inhabitants of Millennius might live in flats that aren't too dissimilar to city apartments we might find here on Earth, their judicial system is suitably alien, as is a lot of their technology. And it's touches like this that really help remind us that Marinus is definitely an alien planet and not an Earth of the future. History, other world, history. Not counting the two episodes that were set within the confines of the ship, as it wasn't a destination, it would follow that the next story would take place on another world again. And like Marco Polo taking place in recorded history helps set it apart from an unearthly child's prehistoric jaunt, the Keys of Marinus' globetrotting nature helps make it a very different prospect from the last trip off world in the Daleks, despite both being written by Terry Nation. The addition of the quest here across different lands and cultures means that Doctor Who's first five stories each have their own distinguishing features and flavours. That also happens to probably be the Keys of Marinus' greatest string, a six-part story that doesn't test the patience by spending far too long in one setting. No, it turns out to be other things that ultimately test the patience. The Sea of Death is a very good opening episode, in my eyes anyway. Yeah, okay, there's a couple of slight production fluffs, but a beach of glass and a sea of acid with a massive alien building set up a really good atmosphere, as does the slow infiltration of the Vord, and the design of the Vord I actually rather like. The first cliffhanger is very strong too. Endangering Barbara is more than enough to get me worried. At the end of the first episode, they all teleport, Barbara goes on slightly ahead, uh, when they arrive, they don't see Barbara, but they find her travel dial, and it's got blood on it. Oh shit, where's Barbara? Oh my god, is Barbara okay? Oh my god, oh my god, great cliffhanger. Beginning of the next episode, she's fine, she's just eating grapes. Obviously, I'm delighted that Barbara is okay, it just feels a little bit... This is another decent episode with some entertaining character moments. Ian doesn't accept any food from their hosts with nebulous uh, intentions because he doesn't know the price yet. And that for me is another, in, an increasingly long line of good old Ian moments. Another follows hot on its heels as they discuss whether they're prisoners or whether they're guests. How rich and powerful do you have to be to give things away for free? He's a good man to have around. Okay, if he's like this all the time, maybe not at parties, but I wouldn't mind his company in dangerous situations. One of those hosts, Altos, is suitably creepy, which I would say turns out to be because he's been taken over by the not only but also brains, but to be quite honest, he doesn't actually stop being creepy even when control of his own mind is returned to him. What are the not only but also brains, Chris? Sorry, a couple of marathons ago I noticed how similar Heron Carvick's morpho brain sounds to Peter Cook, and now I can't unhear it. And if I hadn't noticed that, Barbara destroying their inner sanctum would be air-punchingly badass, but as it is, it just sounds like Peter Cook screams are massively OTT and coming from what is effectively a blancmange. This isn't necessarily a dig at 1960s production values, and I'm the first to defend early Who when good stories get lacerated because of them. It's just that this is basically too big a performance for what is too flimsy a prop. So in this case, it isn't the prop that's misjudged, it's the voice performance. And that aside, I'm actually rather fond of this episode. Less so the next episode, The Screaming Jungle. Barbara gets a cracking line where she says, I do wish Ian would stop treating us like Dresden China. But other than that, this episode is, for the first time on the marathon, an actual slog. Susan's character takes quite a hit from this episode on. And remember what I said about how I'll defend 1960s production values when early Doctor Who gets lacerated because of them? Well, the spikes coming down on Barbara aren't brilliant. 
And the whole thing remains unfortunate when he enforces the bendy bars and old Darius gets stuck in the vines. Help me! Oh, help me! Okay, let's pause for a minute. I know that I said that I would always defend 1960s production values. I know that I said that, and I will. It's just that here, I think the criticisms are valid. Hear me out. I think it's because Doctor Who, before this point, has already managed to successfully conjure up alien planets, alien plants, uh, and different times quite well. So I don't think this really has anything to do with um, the production values because Doctor Who has been able to create stuff, uh, create good stuff uh, within its limitations. This is just Doctor Who not doing this very well at this point. So this isn't necessarily a criticism of the 1960s production values, it's a criticism of the production values of this story. Okay, but things are looking up because the next episode is my favourite of the story. It's just a shame about the title. Here we meet Vassal, whose horrible interplay with Barbara tips over into not-kid-friendly. His terrorising of her does abate, though, as he desists when the men return because Ian and Altos are so intimidating and manly. And the sequence in the caves is also really nicely realised. There's a nice touch when Sabatha asks where Iceland is, um, where, after hearing Ian and Barbara talk about it, and Ian's wistful reply is a really nice reminder of his and Barbara's predicament. And I really approve of these little exchanges because it would be really easy to forget about Ian and Barbara's predicament uh, in favour of the plot of the week and the adventure. So to be reminded that actually this is one ongoing thing where they've just been abducted, essentially, is a really nice um, uh, ongoing thread to keep picking at. And as we head into the final two episodes, we're treated to a really effective cliffhanger as we essentially join a murder mystery. We probably spend slightly too long in Millennius, but it's worth it for several different reasons. Firstly, it provides an original reason for one of our main characters to become imperiled. Ian being accused of murder and facing trial and execution in an alien judiciary system on another world is, when you dwell on it, just as coldly frightening as being stalked by a Dalek. Secondly, and more importantly, the Doctor returns to us. And because he was on holiday, William Hartnell kind of sat out two of the episodes. And his return is surprisingly triumphant. I say surprisingly because whenever I watch this story, I never actually realise that I miss him until he comes back. Though I do always miss him. I think one of the reasons why I don't notice he's gone as I'm watching it is because at this point, the four travellers, they're all set up as equals. So having two episodes focused primarily on Ian, Barbara and Susan isn't that big of a deal. The Doctor showing up again gives the story a proper kick up the arse and William Hartnell has a whale of a time playing detective to try and exonerate Ian. That was a retake by the way because I accidentally said that the Doctor tries valiantly to get Ian off. The actual murder mystery subplot isn't the most engaging but the fact that Ian's life is in danger does give it enough dramatic impetus. Similarly, Susan also gets kidnapped and that ups the jeopardy further but more crucially it gives Barbara a fantastic opportunity to play the hero and um, you know very well, you've been watching this, I love Barbara. Barbara being the hero, I could watch that every damn week. And then we go back back to Arbitan's Island uh, from the first episode, uh, the island in the acid sea for the final stretch, and to one of Doctor Who's most screamingly funny moments, at least for me. The Vord tripping over his flippers gets me every time. I can't quite forgive the flimsy spikes and Darius's pathetic attempts to make the vines live, but I do find the trippy uppy Vord nothing but endearing. People trip up all the time in real life, why not Vord? I would love to be able to say that I could consider the Keys of Marinus is greater than the sum of its parts, but the reality is, it really is just the sum of its parts. Its episodic nature means that it does contain more ingredients than most stories, it's just that some of those work while others don't. So it comes across feeling more like a buffet than a meal. The best bits are sublime, and every bit as good as what's come before. It's just that other parts, they fall somewhat short. After 26 episodes, I'm still very much along for the ride and loving it. It's just that I am a little bit relieved to be leaving Marinus. I am sorely tempted to go for the trippy up Vord. Um, but I think I'll put for the cliffhanger of the screaming jungle as Ian and Barbara slowly start to succumb to the cold. Nah, it's the trippy up Vord. It's got to be Darius fending off those vines. They, it, he tries to make them live, but it... Oh, no.
As ever, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy my trip across Marinus, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps. And let me know your thoughts on the story. Is it a bit of a mishmash? Or do you enjoy the variety on show? What's your favourite part of the planet Marinus? And what do you think is going through the board's head right after it trips up? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you back here for an unexpected engagement. If you don't want to miss that, hit the subscribe button, clang the cloister bell, and I'll see you at the Temple of Evil. See you soon.